All right, guys, welcome back to the third and final video in the pharmacology series on mental health. In today's video, we're going to talk about anxiolytics, which relieve anxiety, and hypnotics, um, which are drugs that induce sleep. Anxiety is referred to as a state of apprehension and uneasiness, um, an overall feeling of tension and fear. Um, it's a, a state of sympathetic activation, and it can be due, due to you know normal causes that would make you worry, known causes, or anxiety can also occur because of unknown causes. Frequently, patients don't know why they're feeling anxious, or perhaps the state of anxiety is um, way out of proportion to the triggering event. Um, and in that case, we start to look at it being as, you know, some sort of disorder, some sort of pathology. Um, <clears throat> again, anxiety involves a sympathetic activation. So think about all of the physical things that go along with the sympathetic nervous system. There are physical symptoms of anxiety as well, not just the mental symptoms. Um, patients who are extremely um, <clears throat> anxious tend to have tachycardia, um, heart palpitations, sweating, trembling, all of those things that go along with sympathetic activation. Now, mild and periodic anxiety is normal. This is something that we all experience. It's a normal part of life and it's not to be treated. Um, <clears throat> however, severe anxiety, chronic anxiety is not a normal part of life. Um, chronic severe anxiety greatly interferes with daily function. And so we treat it. Um, it can be absolutely crippling. So we, we're, we're so far past the days of saying tough it out, which is just a ridiculous response. Um, and we treat this severe chronic anxiety. Now it doesn't have to be with medications. Um, pharmacotherapy is not always the choice. Cognitive behavioral therapy um, or psychotherapy are, are appropriate responses as well. And really what we see is that the best outcome for patients is a combination of both pharmacotherapy and psychotherapy. Um, the combination of the two gives us better outcomes than just the pharmacotherapy alone. So when we talk about using drugs for um, anxiety, anxiolytics is the term Anxiolytics is a term that we use for um, anti-anxiety medications. Um, again, anxiolytics are used for <clears throat> severe chronic anxiety. Sorry, my screen was flashing. I don't know if yours was flashing, but mine was. Sorry if so. Um, <clears throat> When we look at anxiolytics or anti-anxiety drugs, many also cause sedation. Um, so frequently we'll use them as what we call hypnotics. Um, hypnotics are technically sleep-inducing drugs. Now we have some drugs that are hypnotics themselves. They are sedatives or hypnotics. This is what they do and we just use them for insomnia. Um, but some of the anxiolytics, some of the like benzodiazepines, um, anxiety relieving drugs, we also use as hypnotics. We can also use them for insomnia or sleep. We'll begin by talking about benzodiazepines, which are some of the most commonly used um, anti-anxiety medications. Um, <clears throat> now we'll start by saying that all benzodiazepines are controlled substances. Now, what this means for you is a couple things. One, there are certain precautions you'll have to take when prescribing them. Um, for example, you'll e-force the patient to look at other controlled substances that they've gotten filled. Um, <clears throat> you'll also um, you know, follow prescribing guidelines as far as quantity you can dispense, the number of refills you can prescribe, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the type of pad that the script needs to be written on, et cetera. But also, um, probably more importantly for you, this means that there is a potential for abuse with these drugs. So um, different, different controlled substances and really even different benzodiazepines have different potential for abuse. Um, some are more likely to cause withdrawal symptoms or dependency than others, but they all do have the potential for um, physical and psychological withdrawal when they are 
taken away. Um, so that's something to keep in mind when you think about um, if you're going to prescribe them or not to a certain patient, um, if um, how many you're going to prescribe at a time, if it's something you're going to use just small quantities or long term, and then when you remove the drug, how you're going to take it away, whether you're, you know, it's okay to do abrupt withdrawal, whether it needs to be tapered. They, all of these thoughts should be kind of circling in your head, and we will hit them as we go through the next few slides. Again, Benzodiazepines are commonly used for both anxiety and insomnia, as well as a few other conditions. When we look at using them for anxiety, um, there are some kind of pros and cons to benzodiazepines. Pros, they're much safer and more effective than the old drugs we used to use. Um, for relieving anxiety and, and inducing sleep, we used to dr use drugs called barbiturates, barbiturates and mepropamate. And barbiturates are so toxic. They're really dangerous drugs. They have really bad side effect profiles. They're really easy to overdose on and they can be fatal in overdose. They can cause life-threatening respiratory depression. Um, and they have, they're, they're more easily abused. So the fact that we've gotten away from using them and now we have benzodiazepines, benzodiazepines are much safer. They're much less likely to be abused and they're much less likely to be toxic. Um, they have a very low overdose potential when they're used on their own. So they are much safer and better than what we used to use, but they're not perfect. Um, they do have an addictive potential because they are controlled substances, especially some of the shorter acting agents. Um, and they do have a poorer safety profile compared to some other agents that are, um, you know, non-controlled agents that we might use for sleep or anxiety. Um, we will talk about as we go through the lecture, you know, some other agents that have been shown to be successful for anxiety, such as SSRIs. Um, and then other agents for insomnia. For insomnia, there are other agents that are they're non-benzodiazepine hypnotics, so drugs like zolpidem, as well as um, you know simple stuff like melatonin and um, you know lifestyle changes. They should all be attempted before you just prescribe a benzodiazepine for someone for you know chronic insomnia. When we look at the way benzodiazepines work, um, the easiest way to say how they work is they enhance GABA activity in the brain. Um, and remember, when you think about neurotransmitter activity in the brain, GABA is the major inhibitory neurotransmitter. And so we have GABA activity in the brain, and when GABA is working, it's inhibiting a neuron. Um, and what benzodiazepines do is they enhance the activity of GABA. So they um, enhance neuronal inhibition. So you inhibit neurons, that means you're depressing the central nervous system. Benzodiazepines bind to the GABA, um, GABA A receptor, but they bind at a site that's distinct from the GABA binding site. So they bind um, to a different location than where GABA binds. If you look at the picture here, this is the GABA receptor when nothing is bound to it at all, right? You see the plasma membrane. The receptor is an actual chloride channel that um, spans the membrane. And you see we have more chloride outside of the cell here. Um, <clears throat> when GABA binds to its receptor, that opens up a chloride channel. Because there's more chloride outside of the cell, the chloride rushes into the cell, and chloride is negatively charged. So when GABA binds, more negative charges enter into the cell, and that means that the cell is hyperpolarized. Right? It's brought further away from that threshold potential, meaning it's harder to depolarize the neuron, it's harder to make something happen. Right, so GABA hyperpolarizes the cell and kind of inhibits the cell. Now you see in this bottom picture, a benzodiazepine binds to its own distinct site on the GABA receptor. And when the benzodiazepine binds, it increases the activity of GABA. So now GABA binds in that chloride channel remains open much more and more chloride is able to enter into the cell. 
So now, instead of just a little bit of extra negativity in the cell, we have a ton of extra negativity in the cell. So it increases, benzos increase the effect of GABA binding, increase the amount of this negatively charged chlorine that enters into the cell, which means it increases the inhibition in the central nervous system, hence their central nervous system depressants. You see a bunch of benzodiazepines listed down here at the bottom. Um, some of the most commonly used are alprazolam, which is commonly used for panic disorder um, or like acute anxiety attacks. Um, clonazepam is very commonly used. Diazepam is one that we use more for skeletal muscle relaxation. Lorazepam is commonly used um, as well, especially for like um, we used to like in the hospital when a patient's really agitated, lorazepam, which is Ativan, is used a lot. Um, midazepam uh, or midazolam, triazolam for sleep. Tamazepam is also used um, for, for longer acting sleep as well. But we'll talk through all of them as we go. Benzodiazepines have um, multiple different actions, um, mostly in the central nervous system. All benzodiazepines have a sedative effect or a calming effect. Um, some also produce hypnosis, which hypnosis is just artificial sleep at higher doses. So all of them kind of slow things down and produce this, this sedative calming effect. Others will actually induce sleep as the dose gets higher and higher. Um, so you see decreased anxiety occurs at low doses. And again, this is just because it's inhibiting neurons in the limbic system. And the limbic system is your emotional brain. Um, the sedative or hypnotic effect of benzodiazepines, um, low doses again produce sedation, calming. Higher doses then actually produce um, hypnosis or sleep. Now, both of these activities happen because of GABA receptors. But the decrease in anxiety occurs when the benzodiazepine binds to the alpha-2 subunit. The sedative and hypnotic effects occur when the benzo binds to the alpha-1 subunit. Um, this becomes important to realize that there are different binding um, sites. And so that means that different benzodiazepines can have more of one effect or the other. Um, tolerance can develop at different rates since these are different subunits. Okay, so the decrease in anxiety and the sedation and sleep um, are not always parallel in the benzodiazepines. Um, this hypnotic and sedative effect with alpha-1 also causes enterograde amnesia. Um, so the benzodiazepines actually impair memory. They can, while they're, while they're present, they can impair the ability to recall memory, but then they also um, cause enterograde amnesia. They, they inhibit your ability to form new memories. So um, when there's a high enough concentration of specific benzodiazepines in the, um, in the body, you're unable to remember what happened after the benzodiazepine wears off. You don't form memories while on it. They also have anti-convulsant effects. Um, so we'll see that we use them in certain situations when the person's at a high risk for seizures. So for example, an alcohol withdrawal. And then finally, there are muscle relaxant properties due to the alpha-2 receptor at high doses. Um, we think this is because of presynaptic inhibition of neurons in the spinal cord. Again, when the benzodiazepines bind, they hyperpolarize neurons. So if they're hyperpolarizing presynaptic neurons in the spinal cord, they're inhibiting those neurons from sending messages further down to tell muscles to contract. So they relax muscles and they tend to decrease the spasticity of skeletal muscles. Um, when we look at the muscle relaxant properties, again, we'll see that really diazepam um, is the benzo that we use for muscle relaxant properties. Um, there is also another drug called baclofen, which is a, it's not a benzodiazepine, it's a muscle relaxant that likely also affects GABA activity. So it's structurally different from a benzodiazepine, but it likely works in a very similar way. 
We'll talk about the uses of the benzodiazepines starting with anxiety disorders. Um, <clears throat> the benzodiazepines are effective for various forms of anxiety. So this could be generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, um, social or performance anxiety. They can be prescribed um, in the short term if, if a person has some sort of a severe phobia, like fear of flying, but they have to fly cross country for you know, a family member's funeral. Um, <clears throat> and then also anxiety related to depression or schizophrenia. We'll sometimes also see benzodiazepines prescribed adjunctively to the depression, um, antidepressant or antipsychotic agent. When we use benzodiazepines for anxiety, they are reserved for severe anxiety. So they're not the first thing that you would jump on if a patient's just kind of experiencing some mild, moderate anxiety. Um, and we try to use them for short periods of time. So for example, you know, acutely in, you know, panic disorder when someone's actually having an anxiety attack. We do try to prevent use of long-term benzodiazepines um, <clears throat> in patients who require prolonged anxiolytic treatment. We prefer the longer-acting benzodiazepines. Um, so longer-acting benzodiazepines include drugs like clonazepam, uh, diazepam, lorazepam, these agents all tend to be longer acting agents that we use um, <clears throat> for anxiety. Fluorazepam is also much, very long acting. When we look at panic disorder, alprazolam is typically the benzodiazepine of choice for panic disorder. And we see that it can be effective for both short term and long term treatment. When we look at the benzodiazepines and their um, anxiolytic and then their sedative and hypnotic effects, we see that tolerance to the sedative or hypnotic effects typically develops with use greater than one to two weeks. However, tolerance to the anti-anxiety effects develops a lot slower. Um, so patients are a lot less likely to develop tolerance to the anxiolytic effects, which is why we do see that, for example, a prazolam can be um, effective for long-term treatment of anxiety. Um, but it's very, very case-by-case -case basis. And we do try to keep benzodiazepines down to a short period of time. And if something, if the patient needs chronic treatment, we'll try to use something like an SSRI, which I'll talk to you guys about in a second. The benzodiazepines are also used for sleep disorders. However, it's important to keep in mind that, again, we don't just throw a benzo on board if someone's having trouble sleeping. Studies show that cognitive behavioral therapy is as effective or more effective than benzodiazepines. Um, <clears throat> so healthy sleep habits, good sleep hygiene is extremely important as opposed to just throwing pharmacotherapy on board. When we look at the effects of benzodiazepines in relation to sleep, they do decrease latency to sleep onset, so patients fall asleep faster. Patients do also report increased length and quality of sleep. However, the benzodiazepines do um, cause some changes to the stages of sleep that we don't want. So we see that there's not only increased stage two non-REM sleep, but then also decreased REM sleep. Some of the other agents that we'll see, like zolpidem, don't have these adverse effects on the sleep stages. So that's beneficial. Things to keep in mind when choosing a benzodiazepine. So important considerations. Um, to balance the desired sedative effects with residual drowsiness that can occur the next morning. Um, <clears throat> so when we're looking at the different benzodiazepines, they have very different kinetic profiles. Um, there are slight differences in their pharmacodynamics, right? Like how, how they work and what they do. But the major differences between them are in their pharmacokinetic profiles. So like how long does it take before it starts working? 
um, what's the half-life or how long does it actually work? These things are important to look at when you're trying to pick a, an agent for the patient. You need to match the kinetic profile with the patient's needs. So as far as insomnia goes, you, do they have trouble falling asleep? Um, do they have trouble staying asleep? How many hours do they normally sleep? Um, you want to cause drowsiness and allow the person to get sleep, but you do not want residual drowsiness in the morning, right? The patient doesn't want to wake up with, we call it a hangover, um, you know, feeling drowsy and having that somnolence the next day. So you've got to pick the, the benzodiazepine that works just right for your patient, or there are other um, hypnotics that are not benzodiazepines, and we, we fall into the same, um, the same issue there. So as far as like kinetic profiles go, um, triazolam, for example, is short acting. And so we would use that for patients who have trouble falling asleep. Um, one problem with triazolam, um, <clears throat> is that caution with, it happens to have a high rate of withdrawal and rebound insomnia. Um, but in general, triazolam is really short acting. So if you have a patient who just has a hard time falling asleep, but once they're asleep, they're fine, then you know, triazolam will, will help them decrease that time to, to sleep latency. They can fall, or sleep onset, sorry. They can fall asleep. And then because it's so short acting, by the time they wake up in the morning, the effects will be gone. And so they're less likely to have daytime drowsiness. Um, temazepam is intermediate acting. So this would usually be given for patients who have trouble staying asleep, which is common. You know, a patient can fall asleep, but then they find themselves awake, you know, an hour later and or a couple hours after that, and then they just lay there. And so this would be good because it's nice and it's longer acting. Now, because it's longer acting, um, there's more of a concern that there'll be daytime drowsiness. Um, because of that, we do tend to give temazepam one to two hours before bedtime. So it's had plenty of time to be absorbed, to work. The person's plenty drowsy when they go to bed. Um, they can stay asleep for the night, but then it's, it's done or more likely to be done um, the next morning when they wake up. Um, Florazepam is really long acting. Um, so typically we don't use it for sleep because it's just too long acting. Um, so florazepam has too much daytime drowsiness. Because it just works for too long. Um, <clears throat> so just depending on your patient's need, that will kind of guide you through which of these agents you would use if you decide to use a benzodiazepine for sleep. Um, recommendations for benzos for insomnia is that use should be limited to one to two, one to three weeks. Um, I will tell you clinically, this is not very frequently done, but it should be done. Um, and the reason for that is that tolerance to sedation develops much faster than the tolerance to the anxiolytic effects. Remember that those two effects are happening at different um, different receptor subtypes. So the anxiolytic effects you know, can continue for a good long period of time, but the sedation and the hypnosis, um, tolerance develops to that really quickly. So after, you know, a few weeks of therapy, um, that, that same strength of drug isn't going to do the same thing anymore. It's not going to work as well anymore. And then the patient kind of just gets stuck taking it, even though it's not working very well, because then if they if you take it away, there's, you know, withdrawal symptoms and there's rebound insomnia. So it becomes the situation where they're stuck taking it, even though it's not working as well as it should, um, which is why benzos aren't normally my personal go to for insomnia when there's so many other things that can be um, effective without that tolerance. 
Um, benzodiazepines can be used to induce amnesia. Um, that sounds kind of funny that we would want to induce amnesia, but there are some unpleasant procedures or medical situations where you want to not only like sedate and calm the patient down, but you want them to not really be aware of what happened afterwards. Um, in this case, we typically would use the short acting agents. Uh, like triazolam, for example, or midazolam. Um, we can use them for pre-medication for unpleasant procedures. So things like endoscopy, um, some dental work, some really kind of severe dental work, especially if the person is um, really afraid of getting dental work done, um, angioplasty. These are pretty unpleasant procedures. Um, so if we pre-medicate with a benzo, again, it calms you down and then it makes you not really remember the whole situation. Um, and what this does is this can induce conscious sedation. And this is really helpful because it sedates the patient. The patient is calm and relaxed. Um, however, they can still follow instructions. And then again, afterwards, they don't remember it. I um, I stood in on and watched a, a breast augmentation that was actually done with the person being conscious. Um, so they just used lidocaine to numb it, but the person had, um, I don't know, I think, it, I think it was, I can't remember what it was, if it was triazolam, um, but the person was under conscious sedation because they needed her to be able to like sit up and to be able to move and you know to say whether she was happy with the size of the augmentation or not um, but of course you don't want her to remember this experience where there's like being cauterized and yanked on and pulled like sure wouldn't have been pleasant for her to, to remember um so we use conscious sedation sometimes to kind of just again calm them down and then wipe the experience from their memory afterwards um midazolam can be used to induce enterograde amnesia when sedating a patient prior to anesthesia um, again the patient's nice and relaxed and then just kind of slips away into anesthesia without any memory of all of the stuff that was happening as they were um, as they were going into the operating room. We can also use benzodiazepines for seizures. Lorazepam and diazepam are the drugs of choice for status epilepticus. Um, <clears throat> now, we can also use phenobarbital. Phenobarbital is a barbiturate. which again barbiturates were like what we used before benzos but we don't really use them anymore because they're not safe um however phenobarbital is one that we can use for refractory status epilepticus so status epilepticus that is not responding to lorazepam um, repeated doses of lorazepam or diazepam Um, otherwise, again, we don't really use them very much anymore because they have such a bad overdose potential in adverse drug effects. Clonazepam can be used adjunctively in seizure disorders. Um, some uh, benzodiazepines we can use in the acute treatment of alcohol withdrawal. Um, so some of the benzodiazepines have cross tolerance with alcohol. Um, so it can decrease the symptoms of alcohol withdrawal and then also help to prevent seizures, which are associated with alcohol withdrawal. Um, the, the agents that have clost tolerance are chlordiazepoxide, um, chlorazepate, diazepam, lorazepam, and oxazepam. Uh, very frequently, lorazepam will be used. We use lorazepam, which is generic for Ativan, a lot in these types of kind of emergent situations. Finally, we can use benzodiazepines again for muscular disorders. Uh, I told you guys that diazepam is the typical benzo that we use 
for muscle spasms and spasticity. Um, we'll use it to treat the muscle spasticity associated with some conditions like MS, uh, multiple sclerosis, as well as cerebral palsy. Um, some cautions with benzodiazepines. All of them cross the placenta. Uh, they are highly lipophilic, hence the fact they get into the central nervous system. Um, and because of that, they can all cross the placenta. So um, they can actually cause CNS depression in the newborn if given at birth. Um, they are not recommended in pregnancy at all because of their transfer into um, the fetus. They are also excreted in breast milk, so not recommended in patients who are breastfeeding. Again, it's important to keep in mind that, um, that benzodiazepines are controlled substances, um, and because of that, it is possible that they can be abused. So if you have a patient who has a history of um, of addiction or high propensity for addiction, then this is not the first drug that I would go to. Um, they are they have less potential for abuse than some of the other, like opioids, for example. But the potential is still there. Um, they can induce both physical and psychological dependence if used for long periods. Hence, we try to keep them down to an acute setting. We try to use them um, for short periods of time. Also, because of the physical dependence, if they're withdrawn abruptly, um, abrupt continue, discontinuation can induce withdrawal symptoms. So withdrawal symptoms can be you know, confusion, anxiety, agitation, insomnia, restlessness. The agents with a short half-life are worse. Um, so uh, agents like triazolam, for example, uh, midazolam, these agents tend to have worse um, withdrawal symptoms. The longer acting agents uh, with longer half-life are less likely to cause withdrawal symptoms because the body slowly gets rid of them as it is. So the body kind of does its own natural taper. Um, fluorazepam, for example, is typically not associated with um, not associated with bad withdrawal effects. Adverse drug effects of benzodiazepines, um, sedation and confusion are the most common. So uh, caution needs to be exhibited if this is something that a patient's taking around the clock. For example, if they're using it for insomnia as opposed, or sorry, if they're using it for anxiety, um, you know, caution needs to be exhibited if they're going to be taking it and being functioning out in the world. Uh, they need to make sure first that they can tolerate that dose, that it's a low dose that they can tolerate before they take it, say, and go to work or drive a car. Um, speaking of driving a car, at higher doses, ataxia can occur. Um, and again, this ataxia would preclude a person from being able to drive a car or operate any sort of machinery. So this, people need to take caution if they, say, uh, have a job where they might need to get up in the middle of the night and go do something, then they shouldn't be taking these for sleep. Cognitive impairment is also possible. Um, the sedative and hypnotic and amnesic effects increase when they're taken with alcohol or other CNS depressants. This is really important if you have a patient who takes benzodiazepines and they decide they're going to go out and have a few drinks with friends that night. Um, the chances of that person you know, passing out or having no memory of what happened that night increase greatly, which can be incredibly a really dangerous situation to be in, um, especially for young women. So that is really important for patients to know that they cannot have any alcohol. if they're taking benzodiazepines. Um, also, the benzodiazepine, when it's by itself, is relatively safe, way safer than the older agents. Um, it's very difficult to like overdose on a benzodiazepine. There's a ceiling effect to like respiratory depression and whatnot. 
So the person could take, you know, 25 clonazepam and, and not be, not die. They'll have sedation and sleep for a week, but they're not going to die. Um, however, if you mix a benzodiazepine with something else, some other depressant, then they become very dangerous. So mixing benzodiazepines with alcohol, mixing benzodiazepines with opioids increases the respiratory depression. It takes away that ceiling effect and then they can be fatal. So it is very important to be careful, caution when mixing benzos with anything else. They're typically not, um, don't have a big overdose risk, but when you combine them, then they do. Um, caution in patients with hepatic disease, um, as well as caution in the elderly. Um, as far as caution in the elderly goes, if you think about somebody being, you know, confused or having ataxia, right? So not being able to move around very well, that really increases the fall risk. Um, and falls are much more dangerous in the elderly. Flumazenil is an antidote to benzodiazepine overdose. Um, if flumazenil is an antagonist at the GABA receptor. Um, so the benzodiazepine can bind, but there's no GABA binding. So there's nothing for the benzodiazepine to enhance. Therefore, it doesn't have an effect. Um, so we use these for acute benzodiazepine overdose. Now, I just told you guys that benzos by themselves really typically aren't that bad in an overdose situation. Normally, supportive measures are perfectly fine, um, and the person will sleep it off. But frequently, when people come in with benzodiazepine overdose, they have a mixed ingestion overdose. So it's not just a benzodiazepine. They come in you know, with alcohol, benzodiazepines, opiates. Um, if it was intentional, there might be TCAs on board or some other type of um, antidepressant or antipsychotic medication. And in that case, the combination of all of it becomes a really dangerous cocktail. And you want to, you know, give an antidote for whatever you um, give, whatever safe antidote that you can. So if somebody is, you know, drinking and benzos and they come in, you can give them flumazenil. Um, flumazenil is given IV. It has a really rapid onset, which is great, but it's got a short duration of action. Um, the duration of action itself is only about an hour, so there has to be really frequent administration, especially if the person was on one of the longer acting benzodiazepines. So it's not a give once and go kind of a thing. Um, caution, again, it might precipitate withdrawal if the person is already um, you know, on the benzodiazepine and you give them the antagonist, you can precipitate withdrawal symptoms. Um, and it can cause seizures if the person was using the benzodiazepine for seizures. Um, so you can precipitate a seizure in that case. Or also, um, if there was a mixed ingestion with a TCA or antipsychotic, then giving the flumazenil can actually induce seizures in that situation as well. So again, mixed ingestions are important for multiple reasons. It helps to guide how you treat the overdose and it helps to guide how severe the overdose is going to be. Um, adverse drug effects of flumazenil include dizziness, nausea, vomiting, agitation, and then, of course, if you're inducing withdrawal, all of those withdrawal symptoms as well. When we're talking about relieving anxiety, there are other agents that can also be used, um, antidepressants being some of those. Antidepressants are actually a first-line option in the treatment of chronic anxiety. So chronic anxiety such as like generalized anxiety disorder. Um, we would not use antidepressants for acute anxiety. So like uh, a panic disorder where you use something PRN on an as needed basis, antidepressants wouldn't make sense for that. But when you have a chronic anxiety where you're gonna have treatment for a long period of time, 
um, antidepressants would be first line in that situation. Um, they are safer than benzodiazepines when used long term, and um, they can actually be combined with benzos in the beginning of treatment, which we'll talk about in a second. When we look at antidepressants, SSRIs, um, as well as SNRIs. So SSRIs like escitalopram is used commonly, or um, paroxetine, and then SNRIs, um, which we just covered in part one, but like venlafaxine, for example, are all agents that would be used first line for chronic anxiety. The typical um, recommended approach to therapy would be to combine an SSRI and a benzo for the first four weeks. Um, the reason for that is, remember, SSRIs or antidepressants in general don't work immediately, right? They take um, a few weeks before the effects are really seen. So the benzodiazepine will, will provide some relief in the beginning. So, for example, down here in the picture, you see lorazepam, right? Lorazepam is given. The dose is increased until you get to an effective level. And then escitalopram, the SSRI is given, the dose is increased so you get to the, the maximum tolerable level. They're both given for, you know, however long, four weeks period of time, five weeks period of time, six weeks period of time. And then the SSRI is continued and the benzodiazepine is tapered off. Um, the tapered withdrawal is important, so taper off the benzodiazepine after approximately four weeks. Continue the antidepressant to maintain benefit and prevent relapse. If you just abruptly withdraw the benzodiazepine, um, there's likely to be some withdrawal symptoms, some rebound kind of anxiety and agitation, and we don't want that. So we taper the benzodiazepine off slowly so that the person can just stay on the SSRI long term. Now, again, the benefit here is that the SSRIs do not have that, that concern of addiction and dependence, um, which is a really big benefit. Buspirone um, is another agent that we use for the chronic treatment of generalized anxiety disorder. Buspirone has the its mechanism of actions kind of we're not positive about the details, but we know that the effects are mediated by serotonin receptors, and that it has some mild affinity for dopamine receptors. Um, and it has anxiolytic effects that are like the benzos. Um, so it works kind of like the benzos do, but it does not have the anticonvulsant effects, and it does not have the muscle relaxant properties. Um, that we see with the benzodiazepines. So it's just used for um, anxiety. Adverse drug effects include headache, dizzy, um, dizziness, nausea, lightheadedness. These are the most common things that we see. Um, sedation, cognitive, and psychomotor dysfunction are rare. Because of this, um, especially the motor dysfunction, um, this is much safer in elderly patients than the benzodiazepines are. Um, and then also dependence is unlikely. So in general, if you're looking for anxiolytic properties, um, this has efficacy that's similar to benzos if we were gonna use this for chronic treatment of generalized anxiety disorder, um, but it has a better safety profile. Now, again, this is chronic. It's not useful for acute or PRN. So not for acute or PRN like as needed use. Um, otherwise, efficacy equal to benzos. So really a better option than benzos for chronic treatment. Um, here, this is showing you in red, buspirone, effects of bus buspirone, and then this tan color or yellow color is alprazolam, which is a benzodiazepine. Um, so you see buspirone has more nausea, more dizziness, more headache, um, but then alprazolam has much more decreased concentration, drowsiness, and fatigue.
Zolpidem is a non-benzodiazepine hypnotic. Um, it is structurally different from the benzodiazepines, um, but it does cause sedation and hypnosis. It does cause sleep. Um, Zolpidem binds to GABA receptors. Um, it's selective for the alpha-1 subunit. And just like the benzodiazepines do, it potentiates chloride entry. So it also hyperpolarizes the neuron. Notice though, it is selective, relatively selective for the alpha-1 subunit, um, <clears throat> which affects its activity. Um, Zopidem again is used as a hypnotic and sedative agent. We don't use it for anxiety. Um, it comes in multiple different forms. Um, the IR or immediate release formulation is typically used uh, acutely. We, it's not approved for chronic use, whereas the extended release formulation is approved for chronic use. Um, now, depending on which formulation it is, we kind of use it for different types of insomnia. Um, benefits of zolpidem versus benzodiazepines is that zolpidem does not affect the sleep stages. So it induces sleep, it causes longer sleep, better sleep, but it doesn't interfere with the sleep stages, the type of sleep. Um, also, it's got fewer withdrawal effects and minimal tolerance, minimal rebound insomnia, um, decreased, it is a controlled substance, but it does have a decreased potential for abuse. So in general, Zolpidem um, <clears throat> is, is relatively safer than the benzodiazepines in terms of withdrawal, tolerance, and abuse. Um, adverse drug effects include headache, dizziness, enterograde amnesia, kind of a hangover effect in the morning, especially with the extended release formulation. Um, Sleepwalking, sleep driving, and doing other activities while sleeping have been reported in certain patients. Um, and then again, it is a controlled substance. Now, Zaliplon, Zaliplon is a, another drug that is kind of similar to Zolpidem, but it has um, fewer residual effects compared to both the benzos and zolpidem. Um, the reason for that is that the half-life of um, zaliplon is really short. Um, the duration of action is like three hours. So half-life and duration of action goes between like one to three hours. So it's, um, it's really short acting. So it has much fewer residual effects in the morning. So if you have somebody who just has a hard time falling asleep and does not wanna be drowsy in the morning, um, Zaliplon is, is more likely to give you that than the benzos or zolpidem. If you look here, you can see um, the different agents and their, their activity, their length, the duration of action. So zolpidem on average is about five hours, but the extended release formulation slowly releases it in order to lengthen that. Um, Zaliplon, duration of action, three hours. Um, these other two agents we're going to talk about on the next couple of slides. Esopoclone. Um, Esopoclone is a, another non-benzodiazepine hypnotic that we use for insomnia, and it's again got similar benefits to Zolpidem. So, um, kind of similar in general with like duration of action, um, effects, etc. Adverse drug effects include anxiety, dry mouth, headache. Um, peripheral edema is a is one that, that's kind of different here that sticks out with esopoclone. Um, somnolence, unpleasant taste. Esopoclone has studies that show benefit up to six months of therapy. And that's kind of different. Most of the other ones only have studies or benefits or recommendations for relatively short periods of time. So the fact that this has um, evidence for use for a longer period of time um, is beneficial. Remelteon and um, Tessamelteon, these are melatonin receptor agonists. 
they try and mimic um, the natural effects of melatonin. Right? Melatonin controls our sleep-wake cycles. It's released naturally from our pineal gland to the back of the epithalamus. Um, and melatonin um, is what kind of gives us this wakefulness during the day and then drowsiness at night, these healthy circadian rhythms. So um, Rameltion stimulates the melatonin receptor and that's supposed to provide drowsiness for sleep and help to enhance these sleep cycles. Um, benefits of these melatonin receptor agonists is that there's minimal potential for abuse, um, no evidence of withdrawal or dependence or um, any like, like issues with um, with um, you know addiction. So these can be used long term. There is the varying evidence about their efficacy. Um, I did do an up to date search and kind of found a lot of questionable information about whether or not they're effective. Um, so that is something I would look into before I jumped on this. Otherwise, it looks great because they seem so much safer. Um, Rameltion is used for insomnia with difficulty falling asleep. Um, <clears throat> one side effect to keep in mind with Rameltion is that it does increase prolactin. which can be associated with problematic side effects in relation to lactation. Um, Tazimeltion is indicated for 24-hour sleep-wake disorder. Um, this is a disorder that's common in blind individuals, and this makes sense because our natural release of uh, melatonin is, is geared towards or controlled by um, our visual pathways. So like when our visual pathways are really active, that inhibits melatonin release. And then when our visual pathways are not really active, i.e. at night, melatonin gets released and then we get tired. Well, blind individuals obviously don't have this, um, this input from their visual pathways. So there's that, that creates this kind of disorder in the whole cycle of, of sleep and wakefulness. Um, so that's the, the indication for Tessamaltian. Uh, one kind of side effect to keep in mind there is that it increases LFTs. These last two slides are just for you guys um, to kind of pause, read through. Uh, <clears throat> this is just the top of the, the picture and the next slide the bottom of the picture. But it goes through all of the agents that are used for anxiety and sleep. Um, therapeutic disadvantages are here on this side and the advantages are on this side. Um, so we we'll start with the benzodiazepines. Again, disturb intellectual and motor functioning potential for dependence, withdrawal seizures. Uh, withdrawal is results in rebound insomnia here for triazolam. Um, <clears throat> and then therapeutic advantages. So we've got some chronic use for therapy here, especially clonazepam. Um, less potential for rebound insomnia, less issues on discontinuation of treatment with these really long acting agents. Agent of choice in panic disorders is alprazolam, can be bo used both acutely and chronically, um, et cetera. Okay, and then this is just on the bottom down here. We see buspirone, right, which we saw used for long-term chronic anxiety. Okay, safer, lower potential for addiction, right? Does not have the CNS depression issues with alcohol that the benzos do. Esopiclone, we said, was effective for up to six months, which was good. Okay, you guys can read through the rest of these. All right, that is it for mental health. Um, <clears throat> I will check in with you guys if you have any questions. Shoot me an email, and good luck on your exam on Friday.